guys, welcome to episode five of the Big Head Pod on the Dub Network. I'm here with a special guest of mine, a good friend of mine. He's probably, he was like a big brother to me. He's, I'm still trying to catch him in age, but the great Raphael Palmero. Rafi, how are we doing today, sir? Doing good, Kevin. Doing great, man. So we were sitting here trying to figure out today's date, and you mentioned that yesterday was, was what now? August 8th? August 8th, 1988 was the, I played in the first night game at Wrigley Field. How was that? It was weird because, you know, playing there uh, for the two, because it was in 88, so I came up in 86 for a little bit. So for about a year and a half, all the games were a day, you know, during the day, either one o'clock start or three o'clock start. And so uh, going to the ballpark that, that afternoon, it was just weird. Uh but uh, and the lights, you know, it was the first night game, so the lights weren't really set up properly, and there were dark spots in the outfield, so uh, it, it made it for for a weird experience. But the funny thing is, is that we got rained out after the fourth inning, and so uh, and it was Thursday, so on Friday we had a new team coming in, so we actually played the first official night game uh, the very next day, the very next night. So, so you know, we're be, we're baseball players are creatures of habit. So you have a home stand back then, and you're playing all day games. So it kind of just throws everything off, and then all of a sudden you're traveling and playing night games. What was it like? Just so the earliest would have been what a twelve oh five one oh five start. So the twelve oh five start was the earliest that we had one a one twenty start, and then we have a three oh five start. But for us, it was actually no different than spring training. So, you know, playing in spring training, we had one o'clock games. So we went to the ballpark in the morning and we did our work uh, and then we got ready for the game at one o'clock. So for us, it was just like spring training all over again. Uh, and actually, I, I enjoyed it because it gave us the uh, the rest of the evening off and, you know, playing in Chicago, living in Chicago, it's just a great town, great restaurants to go uh, to go have dinner. So um it was it was fine for for me. I mean, I know my teammates enjoyed playing those day games, uh, and especially just being in Chicago. So, uh, but you know, then we got on the road and we played night games, and it made it you know you had to uh, adjust a little bit. But uh, it really wasn't a big deal playing at home during the day. Unless you're coming from the West Coast, coming back from a night game there, West Coast with a day game the next day, those are the worst ones. Having to do that kind of stuff. Well, it, I think usually we had a day off the next day. We were coming from the West Coast, coming back home. Um, I think they would set it up so that we would have a day off uh, because, you know, playing the day, playing day games there, it would have really uh, made it for, for difficult times for the players. Did any of your games ever get, uh, how would you refer to it, where you couldn't play anymore, <laughs> where you were lighted out? Actually, with it? I, yeah, we had some, uh, we had some games where it got late in the afternoon and, uh, you know, getting about six o'clock and it started getting a little dark. And I don't remember ever uh you know, maybe playing in a game where we got into extra innings, maybe. I just can't remember if we got uh, if we got uh, suspended and then picked it up the next day. I'm, I'm sure we did because playing those three o'clock games uh, about six, six thirty, it started getting dark. And, you know, you get into extra innings and what do you do? Because we don't have light. So, yeah, I'm sure it happened many times, but I can't remember off one specific time that, that we did it when I was there. And that that place just the allure of Wrigley in itself. I mean, it's they haven't done much to it other than adding those batting cages now underneath in the outfield. And so you played there when they had the batting cage in the clubhouse, correct? No, the batting cage was out in the outfield. Out in uh, I think it was in right field underneath one of those big metal doors. But here's the thing, Kevin. Uh, I went back to Chicago in 2019 or 2020, one of the two, when I was playing with uh, with my son Patrick here in Cleburne. Mm -hmm. With that independent uh, independent team, so Chicago has a team in the same league in the American Association. So when we went up there to play in that three game series, and uh, we had some time th one during the, during the day one day, and uh, I decided to go down to to Wrigley, and they've redone the whole thing. The whole thing is brand new. It's unbelievable how much work they've done on the outside. I went inside, and the whole stadium, everything in the inside is like a brand new ballpark, the clubhouse is like a five-star uh, resort. It's just unreal what they've done to Wrigley Field. Even walking through, I mean, you remember walking from the visiting side, those, the walls were probably no wider than shoulder width with, you know, with the water seeping through. Are the, is the visiting side still the same way? Like, you know, trying to walk down from way up? I don't know if they did anything to the visitor side. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, to go over to the other side. 
but I'm assuming that, uh, you know, with the amount of money that they spent, and I've, I've heard that it was over a billion dollars that they put into Wrigley Field, I'm assuming that they did something with the visitor side. Now, I, I'm not sure that they did a lot to it, but I know that that, that locker room that was above, you had to go across um, a little pathway across the, the uh, open uh, air, what do you call it? The concourse. Uh, the concourse, yeah. you can see the fans as you walk back and forth to the to the clubhouse. I'm assuming that they fixed that. Now, I don't know how much they did to the visitor side, but I know that the home side is the best clubhouse in baseball. Because it doesn't seem like there was a lot of room over there because it is a – is it considered a historical monument, so you can't really – they couldn't really do much to it as far as – you know, the seating wise and everything else, I was just just interested to see what they had done to it. Because, I, you know, walking through those walls, those tunnels, I mean, you could barely fit. I mean, water seeping through. Uh, and they, uh, the, the clubhouse goes from where the original one is, was, and it went all the way down the left field side, all the way down to the foul pole. So when when you go into the clubhouse, you have to go in through the left field at the left, very end of left field. There is a, uh, that's where the office is. That's where security is. And so you go through there. And so once you get in, it goes all the way down to almost the home plate. So it's, it's at least 300 feet long. And it's just, there's everything. There's a, I mean, there's a, there's a, a game room for the players to play basketball, to play video games. They've got uh, little bedrooms uh, with beds. So if you want to, you know, if you have a night game and you have a day game the next day, you, you have the option to stay at the ballpark. Um, the, 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 uh, training room is unreal with swimming pools and, and, uh, uh, rehab centers. And just, I'm just telling you, it's, it's by far the best clubhouse. Now I haven't been to the one in New York, the, the Yankees or some of the other new ones, but I can't imagine it's anywhere close to what, uh, they've done in Chicago. I mean, you think about the amenities from when you started to where they are now, the clubhouses, and everything else. I mean, is it is it getting to be too much? You, th you think for these guys to be what, coddled well, to a point? I mean, I I don't know. I mean, uh, most clubhouses are pretty nice. Um, you know, we obviously you and I played here in Texas together. Our clubhouse was pretty nice, and they've redone that as well. Uh, but I mean, you want it comfortable for the players. You want the players to to have comfort and to have space and to have everything that they need inside. Um, I just think that what they've done in Chicago is just there's too much comfort. I, I think that you go to the ballpark and there's so much, there's so many amenities and so many things to do before the game that sometimes it might affect your preparation for the game. But I don't know because I, I, I haven't been a part of that. Uh, but I have played in some in some great ballparks with uh, with great visitors clubhouses that have a lot of things to offer. Um, and uh, you know, you still get ready for the game because that's the most important thing to go out and, and play the game. Yeah, I think it's more, I think it's designed to almost want to keep you in there as opposed to keep you out uh, on yeah. the field with everybody where, where you want to be. You know, you're right. It's because it's a family for what we do. But at the same time, you know, you said you get too comfortable. You're in there taking naps, falling asleep and everything else. I just think now it's become the place to it's not the place to ha I mean I understand the hangout part but it's still you still have a job to do to be able to do it but I just think sometimes it's a little bit um, extreme for how it's how it's set up I mean when we played we only had what six coaches now you have I mean is it because there's so many more people now around the clubhouse as opposed to when we were playing well there's still the same amount of players I think the roster's only expanded by one um I, I mean coaching think, wise though I mean well, look, yeah, four or five more, hitting two, coaches and there's more, yeah, there's two, there's two hitting coaches. There's two pitching coaches. There's other coaches in the dugout that, that are there for the manager. There's people in the front office that are relaying messages down to the, to the dugout in games. There's uh, three, you know, two, three, four strength coaches, stretch coaches, running coaches, cooks. I mean, you name it, they've got it, but I mean, I get it. They want to make sure that they've got all the advantages that they can, that they can have. But here's the thing, you know, when I first came up, you know, we'd get on the team bus on a road trip, let's say, and uh, before a game, we'd go to the ballpark at 4 o'clock for a 7 o'clock game. And even at home, you know, you'd go to the ballpark at 3, 30, 4 o'clock. But now, with uh, so many amenities, a lot of these guys are going to the ballpark at noon, you know. So, it, in a way, it's good because it kind of gets you to the ballpark and it keeps you there with, with your teammates for the rest of the day and evening. So, 
I mean, there are some good, uh, some good things that, that come from that. You know, you, you talk, we talk about, uh, we worked with Rudy. I mean, probably the one of the best in the business as far as the hitting side of it. And you see now, do you think these guys are giving way too much information? They're, they're overthinking it. Well, it's not just too much information. There's so many different techniques and so many different things that some of these guys are buying into that it becomes, it just becomes clutter in the brain. So, uh, you know, Rudy just kept it simple for, you know, I remember him saying, Hey, just make sure you get your foot down early, get your foot down. You don't want to be late with your foot because that causes a lot of problems when you get there late. It causes you to have to rush to the ball and you would rather be early and wait than to get there late and then have to rush to the ball. And so that's kind of really the the focus that we had and the thing that he wanted us to, to focus on. But uh, there's just so much stuff going on now, especially online. Uh, people that are amateurs that never played the game that are looking at videos and coming up with their own ideas of what hitting is and what they think is, is right. And so even at the pro level, there's just guys doing so many different things that you forget that you just see the ball and hit the ball, you know? Uh, and I know that it's it's harder than that. It's harder than that simple process. But when everything is lined up properly and, and your mechanics are solid, then really the only thing that you think about is make sure you get a good pitch to hit and, and you know, put a good solid swing on it. Uh, but it's just too much information, uh, too many things uh, that you have to worry about. Now, you know, you, you get into the uh, into the uh, other teams and you're going over the their roster and and scouting reports and you're looking at – you know, not just velocity, but spin rate on the curveball, spin rate on the fastball, you know, all kind of crap that I don't care about, really. Uh, it doesn't matter to me because when I go up to bat, I'm looking for a certain pitch in a certain zone. And uh, when I get it, I'm not going to miss it. And so that's really as simple as it gets. And I think that's what, like you talked about, these these coaches that have never really played, they want to teach um an Aaron, an Aaron Judge type of swing. I mean, the man's six foot eight. I, took, I looked last night online, I saw a picture of Frank Howard of how big that man was. I mean, you can't teach a major league swing to a 12 year old kid. You've just basically got to make the basics for these kids and let them be themselves. And that's, but that's what I think what they're doing. They're taking all these guys, just like you, you probably one of the sweetest swings I've ever seen, just nice and smooth. That's the kind of swing you want to teach kids, but nobody wants to teach that. They want to teach this six foot eight guy swing on a kid that'll probably never be more than 175 pounds. Well, I mean, the way that I approached it is that's the, that's how most players need to hit. I mean, we're not all six, eight, 270 pounds, you know, linemen that can hit the ball 500 feet the other way. So with Aaron Judge, uh, basically what he's doing is he's just inside out. He's got an inside out swing with an uppercut and he's trying to hit everything to right field, to right center, which is not a bad thing when you're six, eight and you have that kind of power because you can miss hit a fly ball and hit 400 feet for a home run, which is what he's doing. And then, when he's on the pitch and they hang him a breaking ball, he might pull it to left center and he hits it 470 feet. So, you know, you hit the ball in the air when you're that strong, you're going to hit a lot of home runs. The problem is, is that 99% of the guys can't do that. If I tried to do that, I'd hit 240, 230, because I would have been hitting fly balls, lazy fly balls to left center field. Uh, and so, you know, you can't teach that kind of hitting to, to most players because they're not going to be able to succeed uh, with Aaron. He's got a lot of room for, for error because he can miss hit a ball and even hit it straight away center and hit a bomb. Uh, but he's not a bad hitter. And the, the things that he's doing at the plate are, are pretty good for him to be able to, you know, to hit 40 something home runs so far this season with, and, and I, I believe he's hitting close to 300. So he is a good hitter uh, anyway, but uh, just uh, some of the things that I'm seeing online are just killing little kids, man. They're, they're not going to be able to advance. No, you're right. It's just, and you know, like I said, we talked about with you being able to your swing. It, it was never. I don't think I ever saw you shoot with max effort any kind of swing. It was just a nice, smooth, you know, through the zone type of thing. I mean, do you see a lot of these guys now just a max effort guessing on on pitches and not even? I mean, I've seen more guys frozen on pitches where they're just going up there guessing. It, it is max effort, but it's not just max effort. is uh, It's a philosophy. It's an approach. Um, so you're going to go up there and you're going to just try to get lucky and try to connect on a ball to see if you can hit a fly ball out of the ballpark. Well, that, that might work some, 
you know, but there's going to be a lot of strikeouts. You're going to leave a lot of runners on base. There's going to be a lot of at bats where you need to move a runner over. Uh, there's going to be a lot of at bats where you just need to put the ball in play and, and maybe get a base hit. And a lot of these guys, it's just all or nothing. And on the other side of the equation, you have pitchers that are not pitching anymore. They're just throwing the ball. They're throwing 96, 97 miles an hour. They're elevating the pitch because now the strike zone's higher. Well, it doesn't matter if you're a good hitter because if the ball is at the letters and they're calling it a strike, you're not, I don't care how good you are, you're not going to catch up to that. And that's what's happening in baseball today. Both sides, the hitters are trying to hit home runs, so they're striking out a bunch. The pitchers are trying to strike everybody out, so they're throwing a lot of pitches. And you have a disaster. Uh, in baseball today the only i think the only human being that could probably turn on one of those balls is probably indio good old ruben sierra he could turn on 170 mile an hour fastball in his eyes he could he could because he could he could get up there but that's just one guy out of the whole but, I'm sure, but people would want to take that swing and try and teach a, a 12 year old kid look you can hit just like ruben sierra you can you can do, do this it. i mean I, my approach was just i mean i i had to use my my hands to hit especially with two strikes i uh, I relied on my hand speed. I, I had a good bat speed. Uh, you know, later on in my career, I learned to use my lower half better with Rudy uh, working with me. I, um, I learned to use my lower half and I started driving the ball better and I started pulling the ball more. But my swing was more handsy than anything, more than body. And what I'm seeing today, I see guys spinning at the plate, just swinging out of their asses, trying to hit the ball 500 feet and it's not necessary. You know, if you can just put a nice, good, solid swing with, with your hands on the ball, the ball is going to carry 400 feet and that's all you need to hit it. You don't have to hit it 500 feet. I mean, it looks good for the, you know, for the fans and, the, and all the clowning around that you, you're going to do around the bases. Uh, and then, you know, when you wear the hat, when you get into the dugout, that's all show. I mean, that's all just crap stuff that's not necessary, but, you know, just put the ball in play, hit the ball hard consistently and uh, you, you, you can be successful. So you, you talked about that when when I when I first came up about you know early in your career you would spread the ball around the field and as you got older you you got more into you know staying right center pulling the ball a little bit more I mean do you see that nowadays where guys are adjusting as they get older in their careers or that's just a matter of it, I mean it was I mean your swing never changed right it just became just a different philosophy to, I mean uh, my my swing was always the same I I go back and look at some of the videos that I have from college. Um, and early on in my career in the big leagues, and it, my swing was always the same. It's just that uh, the difference is, is that I learned, well, you learn how to hit too. After you get so many bats and you go through the trial and error of, of being there for s several years, uh, you know, you start adapting, you start adjusting, and you learn as you go. But I had to make some adjustments with, uh, with my lower half because when I first came up, I was more of a front foot hitter, and I would get over my front side too much, and I would lose the power and the strength of the swing. And so when I came to Texas, I spread out a little bit. I, I widened my stance. Um, I did my tap. I started getting back before I came forward and I started hitting against my front side. Uh, but the swing was always the same. I was just able to generate more power from my lower half. And I learned to stay behind the ball and I wasn't fooled as much with the off speed pitch. Uh, but it just, you know, it just happens uh, after so many at bats and just trying different things. And that's the thing that clicked for me early on. And so I was able to, to learn how to pull the ball in the air and, and hit. And I still hit some balls the other way. But I became more of a, of a pull hitter. And I was able to drive some balls out of the park. Especially in, 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 I don't know what we call it, Ranger ballpark number two, where the ball would sail out to right center, right? Right center. Yeah, the, ball, the ballpark was good. We had, we had that, that wind tunnel that, that uh, the wind was always blowing in from right above the stadium because it was always a southern wind. But then it would hit the stands. And then it would go back out. So it was shooting the ball back out to, to right center field. So it was, a, it was a good place to hit for the most part. It was a big ballpark, but, uh, you know, still nice, nice place to hit the right center field. Now the ball was – it definitely did carry in that, in that corner. <clears throat> so we'll go – you know, going to, you know, one of a few guys with 3,000 hits and 500 home runs, which feat do you think is – was more – meant more to you uh, as you what, – Say that again. Which what? The – 500 home runs, 3,000 hits. Which, oh, which one? Yeah, which one I felt know. more, had more, the accomplishments seemed to be more, I, I don't know what the word I'm, word I'm looking for, more, uh, I don't well, know. You, you know what I'm trying, you know what I'm trying to say. I know what you mean. Um, you know, I think they're both equally uh, important 
They both carry the same amount of weight, but I think they put a lot more emphasis on the home runs. Uh, so when I got the 500 home runs, uh, you know, that was like a big number because there was only a handful of guys. I, I think I was like number nine. I don't know. I can't remember ex exactly the, the number, but uh, there were just not that many players with 500 home runs. So they put a lot of emphasis on that. And, uh, but when I got the 3000 hits, I mean, 3000 hits is a lot of hits. You have to play a long time to do either one. Uh, but just to get the 3000 hits, you have to be consistent. You have to stay healthy. You got to play a lot of games and you have to actually hit. Uh, so to me personally, they're both, one is not better than the other. And I'm, I'm as proud as one as I am with the other. Um, but you know, I don't know. People have different uh, opinions of what's more important. And you didn't miss a lot of games throughout. And how many years did you end up playing, Raf? I played almost 20 years. 20 years. And you didn't miss a lot, well, really, just. Well, I think I averaged about 158 games a year, 159 games a year out of 162. So, um, and really towards the end of my, well, maybe the last 10 years of my career when I was facing Randy Johnson and when he was in the league, that was really about the only time I didn't play. Uh, so, uh, Randy Johnson was just one of those guys that it was better for, for a right-handed lineup to play in the game against him. Than, you didn't, you didn't uh, want any part of that. <laughs> well, I don't, no, I don't want any part of that. Why would I? I mean, I was, I got, I got one hit off of me in my whole career. I was one for 25. So I, I'm not ashamed to say that because in my opinion, he was probably the best pitcher, um, or at least the most dominant pitcher in, in our era. And, uh, I mean, it shows the, the strikeouts and the wins and everything that he did. But for me, it was just an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable day at the plate because I'm not, I wasn't going to do very much. Now, when I faced him, I felt like I was going to do something. I always felt I've got a chance against this guy, but I just never succeeded against him. So, but those were like maybe two games out of the year that I didn't play. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I played in 158, 159 games a year for my whole career. So throughout your, so who was, who was probably the filthiest guy you ever faced throughout your career? Was it a Pedro? Was well, it a Pedro was, Pedro was, he was filthy, but he was hittable. Uh, you know, once we got into the fifth or sixth inning, we could get to Pedro. His, his numbers really dropped after he got to 80, 80 pitches. Uh, but he was filthy. Um, you know, Randy Johnson obviously was nasty. You know, Roger Clemens in uh, early part of his career, he was as good as it gets. Uh, Dwight Gooden, when he, when I first came up, he was probably the best pitcher I had ever faced. Uh, and there were many others. I mean, our, our era, uh, when, when you and I played, there were so many great pitchers, you know, Greg Maddox, who wasn't really uh, dominant as far as, you know, velocity or, or great stuff, but he was able to get people out and he won over 300 games and uh, just amazing. Uh, but I would say Randy Johnson was probably the toughest for me. He wasn't the nastiest as far as t uh, stuff wise, because he, he was 97, uh, three quarters, 97, 98 miles an hour with a nasty, filthy slider, right about slider. Um, but it was just a two pitch pitcher. So for, for righties, you know, he was, I think hittable. And I'm sure there was other pitchers that had better stuff than, than Randy. But for me, he was just the toughest. And now you're not seeing these guys getting into 80, 90 plus pitches. They're getting to about five innings and then they're dumping them off on a, You have a six inning guy, seventh inning guy, eighth inning guy. So a lot has changed with, with that. Yeah. And, I, and I remember when you were, when you were playing, they, when the shift kind of started to come into play with you, right? Well, I think it came in. Yeah. With me and some of the other, you know, move on and, and Jim told me, uh, some of the big left-handed hitters that were predominantly pool hitters, um, but the thing that I, that I noticed back then was that a lot of guys tried to beat the shift and it wasn't as dramatic, you know, the shift was the shift for us, but the, the second baseman wasn't playing in short right field. You know, they just kind of moved over some to the right side, but I mean, and it was still the shift, but they were in I the could, dirt. They weren't in the grass. Right. Uh, I could beat the shift anytime I wanted. I mean, I, I was a contact hitter. I didn't strike out a lot. And I could figure out, you know, these guys are going to move over. So they're, I'm going to probably see a lot of off-speed pitches. And uh, probably they're going to probably bust me inside with fastballs. But I could fight it off and hit a ground ball to third and turn it into a double anytime I wanted, which I did. <laughs> the problem is, is that hitting third, fourth, or fifth in the lineup like I did, I couldn't do that with runners on base, okay? 
And I could also, uh, you know, get a pitch out over the plate where I could drive out of the ballpark or hit a double. So I wasn't trying to beat the shift um, as much as I, I should have, but I could beat the shift anytime I want. And what I see nowadays is that nobody's trying to beat it. There's a lot of guys that are not home run hitters. There are a lot of guys that are not RBI guys, you know, that are maybe 260, 270 hitters that could actually slap the ball the other way and get some hits, but they're not, they're not doing it. No, they're not. And then I, I, I think it's the, was it the Florida state league? Maybe they, have you seen that the diagram of how they're going to play them, I guess in the second half of the season where it's, they can't go beyond, you know, they're trying to take out the shift. And I was yeah. wondering if uh, you said, since so Preston is, where's Preston? He's in double A in Huntsville, Alabama with the angels. So are they, are they do, are they implementing this whole thing there? Yeah. So the shift, uh, the, yeah, they have implemented it. So the shortstop for the lefty hitters, the shortstop can't cross the second base, yeah. the, the actual bag. They, you know, they can start uh, on that side, uh, but they can't, they can't move over. Now if the ball's hit, obviously you got to go get it, but they, they've, yeah, they've kind of gotten away with, uh, with the shift. Now I've seen some, some leagues where they've drawn a line from second base out towards the outfield there's two lines one going towards short and one going out towards second and so there's a white line out there which is is a joke it, it looks it looks like a softball game somewhere in you know uh, you know it's just ridiculous stuff um so yeah i guess they're going to implement that in the big leagues at some point where you can't do the shift wait I mean, where do you see this game going nowadays i mean well, from, from where you were to where it is now it's not going in the right direction. That's for sure. You know, little league rules, you know, extra inning, you got to put a runner on second base. What the heck, man? You know, the thing about it is, is that we have the thing that made our game better than everybody else's everybody, uh, every other game. It, it was pure. Our rules were pure. Uh, you know, you go back 150 years and the game really hasn't changed that much. And now their bases are bigger. Um, you know, you put a runner on second base. Ghost runners. They, they have a ghost they runner now, right, too? Innings, and I'm thinking, do you not have enough pitching to play in an extra inning game? Because I remember playing in 18 inning games where we had to throw five or six guys out of the bullpen. And then the very next day, our starter went out there and threw a complete game. You know, so it's just part of playing in the season. If you play in extra inning games, it, it is what it is. You know, guys are going to have to throw innings out of the bullpen. Uh, but I guess they think that it's boring, maybe, or they need to save arms for they the rest the, of the, the position players are pitching nowadays. Position players are pitching, and that's just the the biggest. Uh, it's just the biggest joke. I mean, because I I never did it. I never wanted to do it. But when we played, you might have one guy in the whole season on your team that might go out there and pitch in a blowout game. Now you see it every day. Yeah. There's one, there's every day there's somebody on the mound for somebody because. Uh, you know, the game's out of line. Here's the thing. I was, I was watching my son play about two months ago. I went up to see him play and they were playing against a team that was tied with them in the standings. Uh, and, you know, their league has a first half and a second half. So it was like uh, the, the first half was still going on, but they were playing a double header in the, in the first game of the double header, the, uh, my son's team had a lead of six to three in the bottom of the sixth inning. And the other team brought in the second baseman to pitch in a six to three game. Both teams are tied for first place. All right. I mean, <laughs> can you not come back from a six to three deficit in the, and they're playing seven inning games. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, all you need is a, a, a walk, a hit and a home run and you tie the game. But for them, it was like, okay, we're, we're going to give this game up. We'll get ready for the second game. It's just uh, the things that I'm seeing in baseball are just out of control. There's no even there's no even a policing of baseball anymore from from the players standpoint, right? When you could throw yeah. somebody throw somebody into somebody to throw at you and then we we move on. Well, it's not even just that. I mean, I'm talking about things that uh that actual players are doing where you on your own team can police your teammates. You know, I've seen guys just clown around the bases after a home run, and that's just you know, it just it disrespects the game, the history of the game, the fans and the opponent. And you don't want to do that. You want to do your you want to you know, you, you want to produce for your team and you want to go ahead and, and be successful. But when you contribute, contribute and then pass the baton off to the next guy, this is a team game. It's not, you know, for individuals, even though we play it as individuals, but it's 
is a collective effort, okay? Uh, but I don't see any policing of, of anything. Guys are getting away with anything. And uh, it's just the direction of the game is, is just not, in my opinion. I mean, some guys may like it. Fans, some of the fans may like the way it's, it's headed. But I personally don't like it. I, I'm more of a old school, you know, go back to the way the game was played. So, so when I came up, you know, I was I was in that era of, of you know, I'm I'm an outspoken person, right? I knew you guys used to used to get on to me all the time for, hey, why, aren't, you know, I should just be in the corner, being quiet, and everything else. And I remember, you know, you guys telling me just to, hey, just just taking the razzing and everything else. I just wasn't somebody who was going to be quiet, and, and I wasn't somebody that was going to show anybody up because I had the respect from you guys and understanding the game, um, but you guys would put me in my place, right? Well, I mean, young players need to, I mean, that's what keeps the game going, right? Is the next generation of players coming up and you teach them the right way. You teach them how to act on the field. You teach them how to act in the clubhouse, how to respect your teammates, how to respect the opponent and do the right thing on the field. And so when players come up, especially guys that are, that are prospects, guys that are high dollar players that are expected to do well, you want to make sure that those guys get off to the right, you know, get, on the right track right away. And so that's when the veterans come in and say, hey, this is how you do it. This is how we did it. This is how you need to do it. And then when you're a veteran, you need to teach the next generation of guys the way to do it. But somewhere along the line, that got lost, and I can't tell you where it was because it's it's not how it used to be. And that's what I've, somebody shared a video the other day of, of you and I, actually. I think I got hit with a pitch, and they were checking my hand down or whatever. You walked over. Looked at my hand, slapped it, and kicked me right back onto the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you just have to toughen up, man. I mean, guys get hit now, and they miss two weeks for getting hit, you know, in the shoulder or getting hit in the in the calf. And you know, back in the day when we played, you got to stay in the lineup. I mean, that's you know, if you're a player that that's an everyday player, uh, you just have to brush it off and not make a big deal about it, and just you know, we all play hurt. At some point, I mean, there's 162 games, so you're going to get hit. You're going to foul pitches off your ankle. You're going to get hit by a pitch. You're going to slide and jam your, your wrist. So none of us played at 100% ever, okay? None of us ever felt great when we went to the ballpark. But at some point, you got to block all that out and get ready to play and play the game and, and just move forward. But I, I see guys just missing time for no reason and guys getting days off for no reason just because they need rest. Uh, come on. And that's why, you know, when you and I played together, I mean, it, it wasn't really, uh, I wasn't joking about it. I was being serious. Uh, but I mean, you turned out pretty good, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, I, Cause exactly. I respected you guys, but also I looked at you guys as big brothers, having older brother. I looked at you guys, I respected you, I respected the game and understood that I knew it was coming, you know, regardless, you know, how I was going to, what I was doing, you know, not being going against, you know, what the norm was, but I knew that what was coming on the backside from you guys. And that's what made it fun, right? It created that, that camaraderie, that relationship stuff that it was nothing personal, you know, from either side, right? When you would have fun with it. It's part of the game. Plus, you know, we're a team. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all together. Um, and then we're all pulling for each other and with the same goal in mind. And when you have somebody or a couple of players kind of drifting off and doing their own thing and then just thinking about themselves and their numbers uh, and their contracts, then it creates a problem within the team. And so not that you ever did, but I'm just saying in general, you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And when, and when somebody's acting up or, or they're not uh, following the unwritten rules, then you got to make sure that they get back in line. And you have, you have some of these managers nowadays that they don't believe, even players, that there's no there's no unwritten rules of, of baseball. So it's almost like the people have taken the game and said, no, your way was not right. We're going to change it all. And there's nobody in between to actually, like you said, to stop this from happening. There are the old school guys that are still there. There's still managers there, you know, that are that in the game that are yeah. trying to help the players. But I think for the most part, it's it's almost as if the players don't like – what their managers are doing, they're going to get fired or they're going to the front office and complaining about it as opposed to having that veteran leader in the clubhouse to say, hey, guys, you know, we, we've we got to figure this out. Yeah, most managers have lost the clubhouse. Most managers have, have lost the ability to 
control the team and, and dictate what he wants out of the club, whether on the field, the way he manages or in the clubhouse, the way he wants things in the clubhouse, it's pretty much all controlled by the, uh, by the front office. And so players are allowed to do whatever they want. I mean, I guess they think that's going to sell tickets or it's going to sell merchandise uh, or whatever it is, but it's, it's not headed in the right direction. It's, it's creating problems uh, for the game. And um, uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't like it, uh, but I, I think at some point a team is going to turn this thing around. Maybe a team like the Yankees or somebody that uh, can go back to the old school ways and maybe teams will start getting back to that. And because if, if a team does it and they start winning, you know, the rest of the teams are going to do it. It's monkey see monkey do. So one team is successful. The next team is going to try to build that team the, way, the right way. And they're going to start implementing old school stuff and, uh, you know, maybe it'll come back. Yeah, those the the blue collar type of players. It's just, it, just the, you know, it, it's just hard just to see to watch this. Uh, what what's the flaw? They're saying let the kids play idea of thinking, and I just, I think they're taking it to a whole another level. I mean, you've got bat flips that are ending up in the dugout. You've got uh, somebody the other day was pitching and just showing guys up left and right. Can you can you imagine that we're playing in, in our time when somebody did that? With that, they wouldn't even, nobody would have hesitated and probably going out there and just started brawls. Well, the thing is, is that that wouldn't happen because the very next hitter would get one in his head. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's just, like I said, it, it, the game is, is so different now and just let the kids play stuff. This is not a, it's a kid's game, but it's played by grown men that are making a lot of money and they're playing on TV where a lot of kids are watching. And so what the big league, but the big league players do, the college players are going to do, the high school players, and so on down the road, down the line, as, you know, even to the little kids that are six, seven years old, everyone's going to imitate the big leaguers. So you have to you have to do it the right way, okay? It's not about just your, you know, your selfish uh, self hitting a home run and, and pimping it all the way around the bases and then throwing up your hands and, and uh, just uh, whatever, man, just hit a home run, run around. Don't be noticed. You already did your job. Run around the bases and let the next guy do his job. Go sit down in the dugout and then keep the line moving. But now it's just about me, 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 me. Look at what I did. And I'm thinking there's been 10,000 players before you that did it better than you did and that have done it a lot more than you have. So keep that in perspective. You know, it'll be interesting to see too. And you know, the, the average lifespan of a major league player from where it was with us to where it is now, when you see these numbers of, I mean, team averages are in the low two hundreds striking out new. I mean, I, the amount of times people are striking out, I think somebody showed a stat of Tony Gwynn, how many times he actually struck out in his entire career. And they were talking about a player who struck out that many times in one month. I know it's I, crazy. I, it's way, but it's what we talked about earlier. It's just the, this, this idea, this philosophy that's already ex accepted, um, you know, you go up there and try to hit a home run. And if you don't, the next guy's going to try to come up there and hit a home run. The problem with that is, is that, you know, you, you have a lot of strikeouts and you don't have a lot of people on base. So when that guy hits a home run, it's probably going to be a, a solo shot. Okay. And so there's no action. There's nothing. There's no stolen bases. There's no bunning. Uh, there's no hit and running. There's nothing that goes on in the game. I went to the Rangers game the other night and it was a two to one game and uh, nothing happened. There's no action. All I saw was swinging and missing mostly, um, you know, a couple of balls that were hit hard and that was it. And so what are fans paying for? I guess you know? they're paying for the experience at the ball, at these ballparks. Now the way that, that they're made, Right. So you paid, you paid for a two hundred dollar ticket to go sit in a uh, in a ballpark where you're not watching anything other than guys swinging and missing and guys throwing ninety seven miles an hour and the ball goes all over the place. Catchers are not blocking balls anymore. Um, players playing out of position. Uh, guys not hustling. I was watching the when the the Rangers got three outs or was it wasn't the Rangers? It was Seattle or the White Sox. I'm sorry. The White Sox uh, were hitting. They got three outs, and so the Rangers came in, and you know how they start the clock because I think you have like two minutes in between innings. I mean, it was a minute. Uh, the clock had run out already, or one minute had run out, and the whole team was still in the dugout. 
the pitcher and the catcher came out and the rest of the team was still in the dugout. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Where are they? When we played, three outs meant let's go. Yeah. You know, you pick up your teammates if they're on on the bases, you bring their glove and you're out there like within 20 seconds, everybody's out in their positions, taking their their warm-up uh, throws and stuff. But now it's just it's almost like a it's almost like a country club type deal, you know. They need to. You need to go back to uh was Wendell Kim uh, your third base coach when you were in Chicago? No, actually uh we had uh I think Johnny Oates may have been my third base coach when I came up in Chicago, but I can't remember. Uh, G. Michaels was there. He was the manager. Don Zimmer was one of my managers. Uh, so I can't remember who the – I think it may have been Johnny Oates, though, but I don't remember. Because Wendell was the one. He would sprint out to the coach's box every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what we were taught. You got to yeah. – maybe not a full-out sprint, but hustle out to your position and, you know – As soon as you hit that white of, line, you're gone. That's part of presentation. You know, you're presenting yourself – uh, to the fans, you know, the fans came out to watch us play. Let's not act like we don't want to be there. Let's not act like we're just kind of drag assing, you know, through the, through the game, show some hustle and act like you care, you know, or you don't have to act, just actually care about what you're doing and, uh, and just be ready. You wonder, you know, you wonder now too. you playing first base you know, for your career of the conversations that were had, when you were playing as opposed to what they're the guys are talking about these days is it you know because you get on there guys are told you know it's it was just a, a a fun conversation i can't imagine what those guys are talking about these days over there are they saying hey don't talk to me right now i've got i'm worried about my twitter followers and this uh, and that no <laughs> honestly i don't know uh you know usually we talk about just baseball stuff you know if you got a hit or something hey i was how'd you feel or feeling good at the plate um, you know, that kind of stuff, but I, I don't know. Um, some guys talked more than others. Uh, I like to talk to everybody. I mean, within reason, I'm not, uh, it wasn't like a full out blown conversation because we have a game to play, but, uh, I see guys hugging now. <laughs> I see a guy get to second base and all of a sudden he's hugging the shortstop from the other team. It's... You did that when I played, you got killed when you got back in the dugout. Oh yeah. It wouldn't happen. No, and, and you're right. The veteran guys wouldn't allow that to happen because as soon as you yeah. would walk in there, they'd probably do something to your locker, do something wherever to where to. I wonder if the guys even dress up nowadays, the rookies. I wonder if they're allowed uh, to. <laughs> I bet that that's abuse. That would that would be that would be uh, uh, that would be some sort of abuse and it's not allowed. So, uh, I mean, I remember one year we I don't know if you were on the team uh, with with Mark Teixeira. We, we had it a year. I think it was, you were still on the, you were on the team because it was Buck Showalter was our manager and we were, uh, we were flying out of New York and I think we had like 10 or 12 rookies on that team. It was September. It was, you know, we had some September call-ups and we were walking through LaGuardia because uh, we had to go through, it was after 9-11, so we couldn't really get on the plane anymore the way we used to. So we had to go through security and all that. But we dressed all the rookies in Hooters outfits. <laughs> and I remember all the guys in their Hooter outfits and wearing their shoes. because And some guys had boots. And I think Mark Teixeira had on a pair of boots. And we're, you got to remember, this is LaGuardia. This is like one of the busiest, busiest airports. And there's thousands of people everywhere taking pictures. And here's, you know, the Texas Rangers coming through. You know, half the team was dressed in suits. And the other half were dressed in in the hooter outfits it was the funniest thing but you could i don't know that they do that these days i mean that would make the news and people would get fired and it's, it would be just incredible so you, you guys got got us in uh new york leaving new york and i had a i got a pink halter top with a blue sequin skirt and you know when you walk out of yankee stadium you've got 300 fans off to the left and you guys made us go sign autographs and I think the theme was pimps and hoes. And then I had to serve food the entire flight back to te back to Texas. It was all in love, man. It was just part of the part of the game where uh, you know, rookies had to pay their dues. And part of it was you had to go through these things to to make us laugh and to embarrass you guys uh in some ways. But um, you know, we respected this the young players. They were all part of the team and they all contributed to our to our success. So but it was just part of what what uh, growing up in baseball was about. I remember dropping off some of the guys in uh, in miniskirts in San Francisco, making them walk to the hotel as well. 
you know, what, guy, what guys went through. So I can't even imagine what – do you remember what they put you through when you're in your rookie year? Uh, gosh, I don't remember. I'm sure it was some sort of dress up, but I, I, I can't remember. Now I, I, I know that there were things that were done to me. Uh, I made a mistake one, one day that, uh, that I'll regret. I, I made fun of Rick Sutcliffe in Cincinnati <laughs> and, you know, Rick Sutcliffe, he was a freaking Cy Young award winner and he was our ace, but this was, I think in 88, I, I don't remember exactly the year, but I, I made fun of him in the, uh, during batting practice the way he was running after fly balls and uh, came back into the clubhouse after batting practice. And he and the veterans got me pretty good. I'm not going to tell you what, what they did with me. I'll tell you, I'll tell you off, off camera, or maybe when I see you again on the golf course, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. And the thing that was, that was the worst part about it is that the manager, I, I wasn't playing in that game that night, but luckily I, I wasn't in the lineup. Uh, but the manager saw what they were doing to me. This is 15 minutes before the game started for first pitch. And what these guys did to me was unreal. And the manager saw it and he just kind of walked and, and started <laughs> laughing. And he just went down to the dugout. Okay. So even the manager was like in on it. That's, that's baseball back then. But that was team though. That's what the that team was team. about. That was a team. Now in the second inning, uh, they, a couple of the guys came in and they uh, they released me from my punishment, <laughs> and so I I joined the team and and learned my lesson. But that and that's that's the stuff that that people don't hear about anymore. It's just you know I'm sure if, if anything even happens like that nowadays, there's there's going to be some sort of backlash about yeah, it, and that's I'm what not- takes away from the team aspect, right? Yeah, I mean it just it it creates problems. Guys, you know they get they. Uh, they're afraid to do stuff like that because, like you said, the backlash, it gets out in the media. It gets out in on Twitter or whatever else. But, um, you know, back then we didn't have beat writers and we didn't have media people looking for dirt or looking for things to to, pit, to, to pin players against players. They do it now. I mean, they're right now they've got people on staff looking for stuff to dig up so that they can, you know, destroy careers. Yeah, it's... It's a shame. It's a shame what it what it, it is what it has come to. And you, like you said earlier, you hope that some players will hopefully be able to regroup and 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 to do this because that hope I think baseball will with the numbers what it's doing. If it'll do, it'll hopefully one day come back to where it was to where you can get back to the purity of of the game. So yeah. we shall see where that where that takes us. But uh, but like I said I just want to thank you today, Raf, for joining. Uh, we will definitely have to revisit some of this uh, yeah. lo- further on down the road and wish you luck with everything. I'm sure we'll run into each other playing golf, doing a little bit of skeet shooting and uh, anything else. And once the boys get back since uh, the place, and, like I said, just, just enjoy it now. Enjoy your retirement and everything else. So well, that's, that's what I'm doing right now, man. Just trying to, trying to get through this summer, this summer heat that we've got here in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but yeah, once, uh, once this heat moves on, let's get out on the golf course, play a little golf, uh, when Preston gets back from the season, just get out there and uh, and just hit the golf ball a little bit. But thanks for having me on. This was fun. Maybe we can do it again. At other oh, absolutely. Places. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Raph. And I'll be in touch, yeah. man. Thank you, man. Yep. Take thanks, care, man. All right, brother. Thanks. Thanks.